As you can see, we're in Joel 3. We're going to wrap up Joel 3 today, the Valley of Decision. Anybody know what you're looking at here? What's this picture? Anybody know? This is the Valley of Megiddo. And oh, matter of so fact, Armageddon. this is the valley where Armageddon will take place. This is also, this little archaeological dig here is uh, the village of Megiddo, which is where the name comes from, Armageddon. Armageddon. Um, many um, great military leaders over the centuries, when they saw this place, Alexander the Great said, greatest battlefield on planet Earth, bar none. If you had to have a battle with armies, this is the place. Um, Napoleon also said the same thing, greatest battlefield on earth. I guess God's got that. He figured that out a long time ago because this is where the valley of decision will take place. Um, for those of you watching by video, we've uh, before you uh, joined us, uh, stopped and read the book of Joel. So I'm asking that those of you who are watching, uh, stop, put a pause on your video right now. Go to your Bible and read Joel 3. Note down anything that you find that you're unsure of or unaware of or have questions on. And hopefully I'll be able to answer those. So right now we're just going to take a small pause, let you do that, and we'll be right back. Okay. Thanks for doing that for us, and I hope you're a little bit more prepared and ready to look in Joel 3. A couple of things I was going to start with today. Um, you know, there are some in the Christian community right now who are abandoning any reference or teaching from the Old Testament. A name leaps to mind, who is heartbreaking to me, and I'm sure for his father who's passed away, Andy Stanley who Charles Stanley's son has a church now, I think it's in Atlanta, and he has told his congregation, I'm sorry? I think it's the same. Maybe, it, I, it, I don't think it is. No, I think oh, it's okay. different. Um, he has told from his pulpit, we will no longer teach the Old Testament because it's not relevant to what's going on in the world today. That is a trend among many uh, woke churches um, in Christianity today. That's, that's the law. That's none of that to do with any of us. We don't have to worry about that. Uh, disturbing in many levels. Um, and the other thing I was thinking about is that many will allegorize everything in the Old Testament, or in the New Testament for that matter, um, and that the wrath of God that's about to fall on the entire unbelieving world is an allegory. It is not true. It is... Um, a spiritual lesson that will not be fulfilled in reality is their position on this. I don't know about you, but if you've been with us to study Joel, you notice that Joel is not only applicable to our times, it is telling us about what's happening or will happen in the very near future. It is completely contemporary. All prophecy is, but this especially is telling about the end time. So, um, if you are in one of those churches or you're one of those organizations that says that this is irrelevant, well, I invite you to go back and look at Joel 1 and 2 and 3 today, and everything that you'll see is telling what's coming, what's going to happen, what did happen in some ways in Joel 1, but everything else in Joel 2 and 3 is, hey, heads up, this is what's coming. Like this, the Valley of Decision. I don't know how you can allegorize or say that this is un not relevant to our um, discussion as Christians when we know that the last battle at the end of the tribulation will be fulfilled at the end of the tribulation, at the end of the seven years. Um, absolutely current, and you see all the conditions forming right now to set that up. So with that little intro in mind, let's take a look at spiritual food for thought this week. Um, I ran across, I got stuck in Isaiah again, and before I show you both of them that I, I ran across, um, I, I want you to notice something, speaking of something in the Old Testament that's relevant, uh, I want you to notice the absolute vast amount of 
spiritual insight that's given just in a couple of chapters in Isaiah. I mean, notice how the topics skip and change so radically in just a couple of chapters in Isaiah. Um, the first one I, I ran across in my studies this week was Isaiah 46, 9 through 11. You might want to read that. Got that? From, can you read that off the screen right here? Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. I think that's profound. I think that's utterly profound. Yeah. And it's definitely a reason to read the Old Testament because that's the beginning. It is. I mean, how, how can you ignore this obvious statement? Declaring the end from the beginning. God knows what's going to happen because he set it up. And yet, oh no, we don't need to study that. That's, I will do my pleasure. Now, does this have any connection to Joel and the discussion of end times? For sure. <laughs> I think it does. He's saying right there through the prophet Isaiah that I will accomplish my purpose i know what it is i've set it up and then just a couple of chapters later one of the most profound um prophetic utterances probably in in the old testament and i'll read this one for you but <clears throat> i don't think we really spend enough time looking at the lord jesus christ and who he was as he came the first time and when i saw this i thought this is I don't think we spend enough time really thinking about Christ in his first incarnation um, and how he came to the earth. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Most people, when you get to this scripture, what they do is they skip verse 1, <laughs> and they go right to verse 2. But to me, I think verse 1, as a matter of fact, as I was doing this little snippet here, I thought, no, 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 I can't leave verse 1 out. Because verse 1 says, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The answer is obvious. Those who are seeking it. You can't have the report revealed to somebody who's not looking for it. And to me, that's what we're doing. We're looking. Now, then it switches gears. Okay, now notice this in verse 2. For he shall grow up before him like a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did not esteem him, stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. To me, that bit of scripture right there, you know, when you see some of the Hollywood, I mean, Hollywood um, pre depictions of Christ, it's always this really handsome guy, you know. It's, but in reality, according to this scripture, he, when you were walking down the street, if you saw Christ, you wouldn't even notice him. Very you know? ordinary. Yeah, just a just a guy. According to you know our visual looking at him, just a guy. And yet, he was the creator in human form walking past you. And what he came to do was to take upon himself that which was rightfully ours. He came in no form or glory the first time. But that's about to change. <laughs> He's coming back, and we're going to know him. <laughs> He's going to be real obvious. At the time of those events, you guys read through Joel 3 already. Where's that, what's that line from? Where is that in Joel 3? Is that the very beginning? In those days at that time is what I have. At the time of those events, yeah. Okay, so the question obviously is, what events? 
What's Joel talking about here in Joel 3? Well, in the sequence Joel has presented his prophetic word to us, it would appear that we start Joel 3, we are still at the end of the tribulation. And you're going to see some of the descriptive um, words that are used that will indicate to you that's what's happening. So what follows are some of the details concerning the day of the Lord. Remember, the day of the Lord encompasses all seven years of the tribulation, but more pointedly, the very last end of the tribulation is the the day of the Lord when he comes back to rule and reign from Jerusalem. So, you know, with that in mind, uh, that's kind of where Joel is going again. Joel's even going to take a few liberties with his presentation and jump back and forth through some events and situations that are not all in strict time order. And I'll, don't worry, I'll, I'll point them out to you as we go through it. But just like Revelation, if you read Revelation as a narrative that it goes from the beginning to the end, you miss it. Revelation has got parts where it takes like a time out and it goes, hey, I want to remind you of this, or hey, let me look forward at that. It's not a sequential thing, it's an informational thing. Okay, and you got to know where it's not that way. The continued theme of Joel's book will show us the basis for the coming judgment of the nations. And today I think it's important that you get that it looks like the, the, this judgment is about the nations, okay? Do you remember last week in Joel 2 when we saw where it, the families had to go individually by themselves and pray and ask forgiveness? Remember the daughters went by themselves and the new, all that part? Now we change gears not from an individual accounting. This is a corporate accounting. This is where the nations themselves are required to give an account of what it is they did to God's people, to the nation of Israel. They have to stand account for it. And this judgment at the end, well, you'll see as we go through this, is where God's going to do that. He is going to bring judgment on not only individuals, but here in Joel 3, it's a corporate judgment that's going to fall on corporately the nations themselves. By the way, <laughs> you've probably heard this, the Valley of Jehoshaphat. I love that. By the way, that name is pretty interesting. Jehoshaphat. Um, you've heard that probably in church before. That there is no place in Israel that is known as the Valley of Jehoshaphat. There isn't one. Anybody ever taught you that? As I did my research on this, I thought, what, what, what? And then I found this. Jehoshaphat means the Lord judges. Okay, that's, that's what the word means. And so this, to the valley of Jehoshaphat, means you must go to the valley of judgment or decision. That's what he's saying. So in this case, the valley of Jehoshaphat is not really a place place, but it's a place where God will judge the nations. Joel here describes the final gathering of the nations in rebellion against God at the Battle of Armageddon. I refer you to Revelation 16, 12 through 16, which I'm not going to read this week, but um, if you'd like to go and look at that later on in your studies, this is a, a good reference place for you. In Revelation 16, 16, I will take one little snippet from that. <clears throat> he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. What that translates to is he is going to bring the nations into the valley of decision, the valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley where God judges the nations. Now, since most of you have already read this to start this, but we're going to read this out loud now. So if somebody would read Joel 1, 2, and 3 in those days and at that time. In those days and at that time, when I restore the four fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will enter into judgment against them concerning my inheritance, my people Israel, for they scattered my people among the nations and divided up my land. They cast lots for my people and traded boys for prostitutes. They sold girls for wine that they might drink. Does that sound familiar like today? What's the big topic recently? Child trafficking. Child trafficking. Joel's not relevant to today. <laughs> Sorry. It's very relevant and to today. And it's much worse than we even imagine. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so, how is this tying together with this? Notice, since we're still talking about the tribulation, 
that evidently leading up to and during the tribulation men and girls boys and girls will be sold and traded just like they're being done right now remember the echoes of what will be in the tribulation are right now forming you can see them you can hear them very relevant to me so what time is Joel speaking of remember at the end of Joel chapter 2 this phrasing and this phrasing is important and I, if I've tried to stress anything to you over the time we've been together it's that key words and phrases are not in the Bible accidentally these are indicators of time frames time snaps the Sun would be turned into darkness and the moon to blood as any time in history has that been not that we are aware of certainly not in since this is talking about the end of the tribulation so we know that at the very end of the tribulation there are going to be some celestial signs that are going to be awesome and terrible and terrifying and that's what this is reminding us of Joel is telling us this is the time I'm speaking of the end of the tribulation this is a prime indicator that the events in Joel 3 mostly occurs at the same time of the second coming of Jesus at the end of the tribulation so it's gonna happen God will bring all nations to the Valley of Jehoshaphat why do you know why well I just kind of talked about it a little judgment. judgment of the corporate nations that's right he's gonna judge them what's their crime partially true we live in a world that's becoming more and more anti-God, anti-Israel, making it ripe for judgment. This is a rocket attack, by the way. I just used this frame. That's what that was in Israel. Um, more and more people are attacking them. And I've already told you in some of the historical pieces that I've mentioned before. Right now, there's a minimum of 150,000 missiles pointed to Israel and the bordering countries that are around them. And they keep bringing more and more weapons in. They do. To stop that's But here specifically, the nations will be judged on how they treated God's people. Israel, Israel, the chosen people. If you are a nation that is persecuted, attacked, maligned, imputed, ridiculed, threatened, harassed, or even entered into treaties with other countries that attempted to divide the land, <laughs> just like Adam said, for peace, <laughs> I have bad news for you. Time's up. Your payback date has just arrived. If you're one of the nations surrounding Israel and have threatened to throw them into the sea. <laughs> woe unto you. Woe, woe unto you. Um, by the way, can you think of any nations that would be included in that awful group right off the top of your head? Iran. Iran. Syria. Syria. Turkey. Turkey, Lebanon, <laughs> everybody around them. Especially, and I'm going somewhere with this, the nations that physically touch the border of Israel. If they physically touch the border of Israel, the first bit of judgment that I think is going to happen before this is the Psalm 83 war. And that's where Israel essentially decimates the nations that are threatening them, like this. Um, you know in a war that's I think soon to happen and I could be wrong in this particular piece but it seems that way would that include the once United States of America yes they're turning their back on Israel yeah we are so Joel 3 relevant as it is in our time is saying if you're a nation that is threatening to do harm to my people or its land there is a judgment coming to you and your nation remember last week in Joel 2 we talked about individual responsibility and wrath that falls on those who are not accepting of God's plan this week we're talking about a corporate judgment that's going to fall on nations that reject treatment of the nation of Israel in a respectful kind way if you do not treat my people kindly and respectfully I have bad news for you bad news is coming your way <laughs> notice the crumple up piece of paper you get that. so again payback time is coming for you let's go let's go ahead and read Joel 4 through 8 
somebody who hasn't read. I'll read it. Ready? Ye and what ye to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, and all the coast of Palestine, will ye render me a recompense? And if ye recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon you, your own head? Because ye have taken my silver and my gold and have carried it into your temples, my goodly, godly, pleasant things. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians, that ye might remove them far from their border. Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither ye have sold them, and will return your recompense upon your own head. And I will sell your sons and daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabaeans, to people far off. And for the Lord hath spoken it. And it will happen when he's spoken. And he spoke it, it's going to happen. Now, this is one of those pieces here in Joel 3 where there's actually a, a jumping around of intent from Joel. What he's saying is, if you remember back in the history of Israel, my people have been sold, bought, conquered, attacked, taken away, mistreated over the centuries, okay, by various and sundry people groups, have attacked, maligned, taken me, my people captive, made them slaves, all that good stuff. Now, many of that was allowed because of God's absolute horror at how his people had treated in his covenant with them. They had broken his covenant. And so he allowed some of this to happen. But regardless, even into, up until the time that we're in now, if you're one of those nations that in their history, unless you changed your uh, attack or, excuse me, uh, approach to Israel um, over the centuries, if you're still hostile to them, and at any time in your history as a nation, you have mistreated the nation of Israel, bad things are coming your way in the end. That's what Joel is being told through the Spirit that's getting him to write these things. The Lord focuses on the actions of Tyre and Sidon. You remember I mentioned just a minute ago that the nations that physically touch the border of Israel, everything that's mentioned in Joel 3, every nation, every people group, every reference to a nation in Joel 3 is one of those countries that touches the border of Israel. Not accidentally, okay? So, and it also includes some, what we call the outer ring countries like Turkey, um, Iran, which would be Persia back in those days. So those are the outer ring countries, but mostly what's talked about here in Joel 3 are the inner ring countries, those that physically touch the border of Israel. So, you know, Tyre, by the way, that's Philistines. That's Gaza Strip. Okay, that's along the coast of Israel. Okay, that's the Philistines. So, we're going to talk about Edom. Edom is southwest of Israel, below the Dead Sea. Do you remember when the nation of Israel was coming in the Exodus, and they were asked to pass through the land of Edom, and Edom made them go around? God remembered. Cha-ching! It's a mark for you. Something bad's going to come your way because the so as you look at all the references of the country names here in Joel three, think countries that touch the border or are right close to Israel, and that's everything that's being mentioned right here. So the modern equivalent of today's southern Lebanon, the Gaza Strip. God asked this question, which I think is interesting. Hey, are you trying to repay me for something I've done? What? What, me? What have I done to you? Hey, what have I ever done to you? You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's, I get that Sylvester Stallone thing going on. Uh, but, I mean, that's, that's what God's asking these nations. What have I ever done to you? What have I, how, how, did I pick on you in some way? What you have done to my people, notice what's happening here, that I will return back on you. <laughs> In the last days, God will devastate these regions around the nation of Israel. He's going to take them out. Bad news coming your way. Remember all the nations that border and touch the nation of Israel. What if that includes Germany? Mm, Germany in the uh, Ezekiel 38-39 war is mentioned by the name of Gomer. 
Gomer is Germany. Don't so you find involved. that interesting? So it's involved. Yeah. Uh, in the, yeah, that's not going to be good. So anyway, currently the region mentioned in these verses are strongholds of the terrorist groups Hamas and Hezbollah. If you've been watching, there's been lots of attacks in Damascus over the last few days. There's been attacks um, on U.S. base. Why are we in Syria? We have a U.S. base in Syria. It was attacked and some soldiers were killed this week. You hear that in the news? No, no you didn't hear that in the news because they don't want you to know that. So we, <laughs> I think you follow this theme, we are part of the nations that are doing things that are bringing harm to the nation of Israel. That means God's already told us what's going to happen. So in this area, these terrorist groups, Hamas and Hezbollah, their primary mission, remember what God said, what you plan for me, I'm going to do to you. Okay? <laughs> what you're saying you're going to do to my people, that's what's going to come back on you. Be careful what you wish for. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, um, and their primary mission is the destruction of the nation of Israel. Okay, if your nation or people group, <laughs> its primary goal is to destroy the nation of Israel, what does God promise to you? What you plan for my people, I will do to you. <laughs> so, bad news. Uh, their primary mission is to destroy the nation of Israel, to push them into the sea, to have their name remembered no more. Be careful what you say. Be careful what you say. God says that their own intent will spell their own end. What you have intended for my people is what's going to happen to you. You want to push my people into the sea? Guess where you're going? Into the sea. <laughs> The hatred of these groups can only be explained by understanding the spirit behind their belief systems. Now, I picked a couple of pictures here because I'm, I'm emphasizing the concept of spirit. Okay, you ready? Now, look at this picture and tell me what spirit does this make you think of. Notice the hand salute yeah. of Hamas uh, on the right. Hitler. What was Hitler's? Nazis. Yeah, it's the Nazi salute. Uh, and by the way, notice how they march. They goose step. Yeah, yeah. Is that a spirit that has been before? Oh, yeah. The final solution that Hitler and Himmler came up with in World War II was the extermination of the Jewish people from the face of the earth. That spirit has been transferred into those Muslim nations that surround and touch the border of Israel. Do you understand their spirit by how they act and what their claims are? It's exactly the same as Hitler. It is Antichrist's desire, and will his attempt will be during the tribulation to exterminate after the first three and a half years when he's fooled them into believing that he is the Messiah, he will destroy them. Ishmael's descendants. Ishmael's descendants, absolutely right. The prophecies of the destruction of the nations that oppose God's people, and I found some. In Ezekiel 35, uh, 25, 14 through 7, it says, I will lay my vengeance upon Edom. Remember, Edom is southwest of Israel. It's in, okay, down there, south of the Dead Sea. By the hand of the people Israel, and they will do to, in Edom according to my anger and according to my fury, and they shall know my vengeance, saith the Lord. Again, all those nations that touch the border, they're going to be dealt a bad blow. And not just Joel is saying it, Ezekiel is saying it as well. And he continues, Thus saith the Lord God, because the Philistines, think Gaza Strip, have dealt uh, by vengeance, revenge, and have taken vengeance with, all, with a spiteful heart to destroy it for its old hatred. It goes all the way back to the Exodus, this old hatred. Ishmael, the sons of Ishmael and the sons of Jacob. Yeah. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will stretch out my hand upon the Philistines, and I will cut off the... And I, looked, I had to look that word up, cherithims. And that's actually Negev Desert, which is also south of Israel. And the Cretans... <laughs> which the nation of Crete is a, like an island. And so even those people have a hatred, and God's remembered their hatred for them. Um, and I, again, I didn't know what that word was, so I had to go find out so I could tell you guys what that was. Uh, and destroy the remnant of the seacoast. Again, seacoast, Philistines, that's Gaza Strip right there. 
and I will execute great vengeance upon them with furious rebukes and they shall know that I am the Lord and when I shall take my vengeance upon them and I also found in Ezekiel 35 a few chapters later this reference set my face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it again those are Mount Seir is one of the countries that touches the border of Israel it's south also it's kind of in the Geb desert too I say unto it, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against thee, and I will stretch out my hand against thee, and I will make thee a most desolate. I will lay my thy cities waste, and your, they shall be desolate, and know that I am the Lord. Because thou hast a perpetual hatred, and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel by force of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity had an end, Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will prepare thee unto blood, and blood shall pursue you. Since thou hast hatred blood, even blood shall pursue thee. Pursue thee. Thus will I make Mount Seir most desolate, and cut off from it him that passes out, and him that returns. Again, another way of saying, those nations are going down. All of them. All of them that have hatred against Israel. Judgment from our eyes is about the only aspect of God's plan for the ages that's plainly logical. Now, I, I got on kind of a side thought here as I was writing this lesson, and I thought, as I'm thinking about judgment, you know, you think about people who do bad and terrible things, judgment should fall upon them. You know, people who kill innocent folks and who rob and steal and do all kinds of horrible things. You know, judgment on those kind of people makes perfect sense to me. I don't know about you, you know, that, that sounds right. If you do something wrong, judgment should come upon you, right? So, but from our eyes, that's just logical. Right? If you do something bad, you, know, you should get punished for it. But there's some illogical things in the scripture that I think we need to take a look at. The grace and mercy of God are not logical. Do we deserve grace and mercy? Absolutely not. It's not logical. God loves us in spite of ourselves because we've come to realize that his son Jesus is the only way. Salvation by grace through faith is not logical. You mean to tell me that if I'm a sinner and I believe what Jesus did on the cross as a remission for my sins, that he died and three days later rose from the grave, is now ascended into heaven, sits on the right hand of the Father, and has forgiven me my sins because I believe what he did for me. That's not logical. But that's biblical. But it shows the power of what he did. It does. Because it was so powerful, his sacrifice, that yep. it is able to cover our sins. It is. And, and that's not logical. I, how does that how does that work out? It doesn't matter. God told us it's true and we believe it. And, and so there it is. The high standing and destiny of a believer in Jesus Christ is not plainly logical. What does the Bible tell us that we get because we believe in the Lord Jesus? We get to rule and reign with him. All our sins are forgiven. They're cast into the sea of forgetfulness. It's not in, we have propitiation. We have, we have eternity with Jesus. Yeah. How is that logical? How is that, how should we, you know you, you know you. Who's logical? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, not yeah. We're going by man's logic, but not God's logic. But getting back to judgment again, judgment, God simply giving those who reject Him for what they deserve. That's logical. <laughs> that makes sense to me. But as I was thinking about the judgment piece, we're, we can we get the judgment piece, but the other grace piece, that doesn't that what? But God just says believe. This is what I told you to do, believe. And I'm going to take care of the judgment for you. This is what he says to those who have rejected his message. You have rejected the mercy and grace of heaven. So I will give you the plain logic of the earth. You will receive what you deserve before the holy court of my justice. Here's an old saying that holds true. You reap what you sow. And Joel's telling the nations around Israel, <laughs> there's a crop coming and you ain't going to like it. <laughs> the United Nations will be used by the Antichrist to set up his kingdom. 
they will confirm a covenant with many in September. That's next month. All of these are indicators, and I'm not saying that the covenant with many is the one spoken of in Daniel 9.27. I'm not saying that. It might be, but there's some things that have to happen between now and next month for that to be so. But it is an indicator. When you see the United Nations forming committees and talking about seven-year plans, and the Bible has told us for, for centuries that in the last days there will be seven years of tribulation, it gets your spiritual attention. It sets up your antennas. It says, hey, wait a minute. I know what the Word says. The Word says there's going to be a seven-year period at the end that God will judge the nations. Just saying. I found this little piece that said, We the people of the United Nations resolve to work together to achieve these aims and human rights and social progress, which is a scary, scary phrase right there because that means equity, not equality. That means everybody has to have the same playing field. Everybody is level. You can't have more than I do. If you do, that's racist in some way. That's, that's the goal of the United Nations. By the way, guess what the goal of the Antichrist will be? Kumbaya, all have, we're all the same. We all have the same stuff. We all, nobody has. We have nothing and you'll be happy. And you'll be happy. Equity, there's that word, okay, and peace and justice. Again, don't be deceived. The word tells us in the last days, people will believe the lie. This is the lie. The lie is man can fix your problem. You don't need God. Read Joel 3, 9 through 12. Anybody who has that handy, let's go ahead and knock that out. Uh, announced this far and wide, get ready for war. The strip your best soldiers, collect all your armies, help your plowshares into forts, and beat your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak be strong, gather together, and come all nations everywhere. And now, O oh Lord, bring down your warriors, collect Collect the nations, bring them in the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to pronounce judgment on those of them all. Okay. A time for turning plowshares into swords. It sounds a little opposite of what we normally hear, doesn't it? Because we understand that verse 10 in this passage is the exact opposite of the UN Charter statement. In Joel 3, verse 10, Joel is telling at the end times, during the end of the tribulation, it won't be what the charter for the UN says its intent is. It will be the opposite. And this I found interesting as I look more into that passage. So what does Joel see in this prophetic passage here? Prepare for war. He's telling the nations of the world God's coming back, and if you oppose him, you better get your armies together. God challenges the nations to prepare for war against him. At the end of the tribulations, the nations will do just that. But God will simply laugh at the puny and futile preparations of the nation. Almost like Joel out of the corner of his mouth. Hey, y'all, <laughs> you going to stand against the Lord? You know, you guys go better do a little you know, training and preparing, get your weapons together. <laughs> like it's going to do you any good. But go ahead. I want you to go ahead and be ready because this is what your intent is. So, uh, <laughs> And the Lord is doing what? Well, and he's reminded me of Psalm 2 is what he reminded me of. Why did the heathens rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast their cords from us. By the way, that is a direct reference to the Antichrist's message to those who have rejected Christ on the earth during the tribulation. There ain't no God. We don't need a God. Why well, worry about his rules? Break the bands and cast their cords away from us. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. Can you imagine? The Lord, creator of all, sitting in the heavens, listening to, okay, guys, we're going to get this together. We're going to get a big army here. We're going to go defeat the Lord Jesus Christ when it comes. <laughs> you, what? I mean, I have this visual image because you can't see the Father's face, but. <laughs> what? Your plans. That's right. <laughs> Look at these clowns. I mean, it's like, what are you thinking? Yeah.
By the way, I don't know why this struck me, but you remember David and Goliath and the little guy wins? This is the opposite of that. The little guy ain't winning this time. Goliath is winning because Goliath, in this case, is God. See something? Yeah, in verse 4, you, I don't guess you've gotten there yet, but what does the word derision Derision is like, get out of here. That's like, you got to be kidding me. That's what derision is. He laughs at them in a scoffing, ridiculous way. You are crazy if you think you're going to beat me. Then he shall speak unto them with his wrath and vex them with sore displeasure. I guess so. Remember, how does the Lord defeat the armies at Armageddon? Speaks he speaks the, the word and they're destroyed. Last week we talked about the people still in the cities, but the armies, it's not going to be a big battle here. It's like, okay, we got all our weapons, they're polished, everything's clean, we're ready to go, we got our battle plan, and the Lord comes and goes, die. <laughs> and battle over, valley of decision. <laughs> Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? It's going to go bad for you. It's going to go bad for you real quick. You think it's because people are deceived? They are deceived. They no. believe they can defeat the Creator. They are deceived. They're deceived right now. I mean, His Father created us. How could they imagine they could go and do anything about it? Well, I'm wondering if, do they really believe in Him? The Antichrist? Or? Do people that are fighting God really believe that they are fighting God? I don't know. That's a good question. Maybe it's like they've been deceived in the sense that this is really not God the Creator, but some other force that we have to defeat. Maybe they've been... They, they have no idea what the Oh, right. They don't. I mean, you would have to say that that's true because who in their right mind would go, hey, I'm going to defeat the Creator today with an M16. Uh, no. I mean, uh, that would take a lot of arrogance. Oh, man. And, you know, I'm thinking about that verse in Thessalonians where it says that God sends them the great delusion. Yeah, the great like lie. He's deliberately blinding their eyes yeah. so that they will believe the lie so that he will judge them. Bring which them I've to never, the valley of decision. Which really I've always thought seemed a little unfair. but well, If you finally reject it, it. Yeah, it, the ultimate rejection, and I think God knows everything, of course, but he looks into your heart. Remember, he says he didn't look at our outward appearance. He looks at the inward, our heart, where our heart's coming from. He can look into your heart and say, yeah, she, she's one of mine, and she, he's one of mine. And that guy, he ain't ever going to be one of mine because it's obvious he's, he's rejected me completely. His heart is so hardened that the only thing he's going to believe is the lie. And that's what he gives them, what he asks, what, he, what they're looking for. Anyway. This I found interesting from a military standpoint. Train even your weakling to be warriors. Do you have any of that? That's one of my versions uh, of the Bible I looked at in that section. That's what it said. I thought, what? What? Train even your weaklings to be warriors, i.e. call up the reserves. Everybody will be needed in this fight. Yeah, I think everybody who's, if you're going to defeat the Lord, you're going to need all your reserves to be called up. Um, you know, and then Jan knows this as well as I do, but... I served in the guard for 12 years, and then I was still, until I turned 60, I, I think it's 60, when I finished, they can't call you up anymore. <laughs> you know, if you're you know over 60, then, you know, they're not going to call you back in the military. Okay. It's like when I became 60, it's like, okay, that's yeah, good enough really good for that. <laughs> um, but think about it. it in, during World War II, Hitler literally called up his youth. He called up his the Hitler Youth. He called up um, old men who could barely even function. And that's who was manning the, f the front lines at the very end, because there was nothing left. And when you get to the place where you call your weakly, weakest people into your army. You're in trouble. Oh, by the way, for those of you who have not seen anything about the Ukraine war, because nobody will tell you, um, for the last six months, they've had what's called um, snatch and grab units that go out and literally drive up and down the roads in Ukraine. If they find a, a man who is physically, looks like able to walk and move around, they grab you and throw you in the van and you're in the army. Recruiting, huh? recruiting. Anybody ever tell you that? Is anybody showing you those images? They've been doing that for six months. They throw these old men and young boys and people who are trying to avoid going to serve what they know is a lost cause and they're throwing them in the front line and they're killing them. 
So you better hide if you. Yeah, that's bringing up the weaklings, bringing up the reserves, bringing up those who can't really help you anyway. They're just cannon fodder. Yeah, the old saying is, you're always stronger as your weakest link. You are. That's exactly right. But when you, I saw that phrase, and I thought, train your weaklings to become warriors. That's your, it's the bottom of the barrel, guys. That's dregs times. Come to the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Judgment is waiting for you there. Oh, by the way, the other thing I was going to say before I left that one thought is, um, by the time the end of the tribulation comes, the population of the earth is going to be very low. Most of the military-aged men at that time will be killed or already in service in some way. The only folks that are going to be left are the weaklings that are wandering the streets. And what kind of condition are those folks going to be in? Scrounging to try to get food, barely living, just trying to get by a very horrible subsistence level, I'm sure, at that point. Just put more emphasis on the fact that they're bringing in the weaklings into the army at that point. Judgment is coming. Nations will adopt Hitler's creed, the final solution. I don't think enough emphasis is put on this concept as we talk about the final days during the tribulation. As I showed you that picture of Hezbollah and Hamas, they have adopted the military style and even salutes of Hitler. Hitler's final solution was, and by the way, the same solution that's going to be presented by the Antichrist to all these people in the final days is, the only way to have world peace is the complete extermination of the Jewish people once and for all. He's going to tell them, We'll have peace on the earth if we kill all the Jews. The valley of decision. Little do they realize that God's judgment awaits for them in the valley of Jehoshaphat. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Such will be the end of the nations that march against Israel. Could it be that the valley of Jehoshaphat will be created when Jesus touched down on the Mount of Olives? Massive earthquake. Now, this is something I did a little side thinking. I was going, no valley. Because when I started looking at my commentaries, and I have Bible encyclopedias and dictionaries and all kinds of stuff that I started looking at. By the way, I'm old school. <laughs> I actually, I didn't type it in online. You know, I didn't Google it. I, I, <laughs> I just got my books out, you know, the paper things that have words on them. You know, for those of you who are you know, too young to realize what reading is. And I got my resources out, and I kept looking through my resources for the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And all the references were, there isn't one. That's a name used to decide or to describe where God's going to judge the people. But then I started thinking about Mount of Olives. Because when Christ comes back, and he finally touches down on the earth, his feet touch the Mount of Olives, right? right. Something happens to create a valley. And I thought, I wonder. So I went and I found Zechariah 14, 2 through 7. The Lord will rule the earth. Then the Lord will go out to fight against those nations as he had fought in times past. Okay, now listen to this phrase. Again, I'm in Zechariah where Joel is telling us this. Um, Ezekiel is telling us this. John told us in Revelation this is going to happen. And again, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, something is confirmed. So Zechariah is telling us that on that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. There is no other time in history that that's going to be accomplished except the end of the tribulation. It has to be what he's talking about. East of Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives will split apart, making a valley wide running from east to west. Half the mountain will move to the north and half to the south. You will flee through this valley for it will reach across to Azel. Now, I'm not really sure about the reference to Azel, but it's obviously an escape place to go to. Yes, you will flee as you did from the earthquakes in the days of King Uzziah of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all his holy ones with him. That would be us <laughs> coming with him. On that day, the, notice this phrase. I think this is really interesting. On that day, the sources of light will no longer shine. You won't see the sun. You won't see the moon. You won't see the stars. Yet there will be a continuous day. Only the Lord knows how this can happen. Literally, there will be a glow, but it won't come from the sun, the moon, or the stars. It will come from Jesus. It will, coming back. Just like he said in the temple, that the light will be in the, in the uh, new Jerusalem, the new heaven, and the new earth. There will be no normal day or night 
for at evening time it will still be light okay for those of you who say oh the old testament what's i got to do with anything why should we study that by the way here a little there a little precept upon precept line upon line this is looking looking down from the mount of olives yeah this is what this is this is where christ will touch down i doubt seriously if the dome of the rock will be there when his feet touch the mount of olives uh, and, and just speculating of course but we know that this is the view he's going to see when he touch. Notice I tried to pick a picture of a night, you know, a night where it's like the light is a little different. Which is north and which is south? I'm, I'm not really sure from this perspective. I think to my right, uh, or as you're looking at this, if you go right, I think that's, I think that's north. Well, you got to think about he's down on Mount Olives. He's going to go through the east gate. Yep. Yeah. East right. gate's right over there. So. East would be that way. So. From our perspective, it's yeah. east. Yeah. Yeah, this would be east, and so that would be west, so that would have to be north, and then that's a... So anyway, I saw that, I had to, I took some time to try to find an image of the Mount of Olives and what Christ would see as he touched in. Okay, let's read uh, the dreaded wine press of God. This is verses 13 through 16. We're almost done, believe it or not. I told you I was going to make it short this week. Uh, now let the ship will do its work. The harvest is ripe and waiting. Bend the wine press for it is full to overflow with the wickedness of these men. Multiple, multitudes, multitudes, waiting in the valley for the birth of their day. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of judgment. The sun and the moon will be darkened and the stars will draw their light. The Lord shouts from the temple in Jerusalem, and the earth and the sky began to shake. But to his people of Israel, the Lord will be gentle. Is their refuge and strength. Yeah, and notice that too. It's talking about the darkness, the light not shining, all that. Just like Zacharias said, these are all indications of this time, this final peace at the very end of the tribulation, the dreaded wine press of God. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. If you remember the first screenshot that I had for you as we started this lesson, the Valley of Megiddo, the Plains of Megiddo, if you can imagine that whole plain filled with armies, all marching, you got to keep this in mind, that they're marching from the north. By the way, the Plain of Megiddo is north of Israel, of Jerusalem. That's where the plain is. This is the place where they're going to assemble to attack Jerusalem. They won't make it to Jerusalem. <laughs> In the valley of decision will be their deathbed. All the nations are brought to this valley for God to pass judgment on them. Notice, and again, I tried to stress this in Joel 3. This is a corporate judgment. As a collective, this indicates God requires every nation's citizens to answer how they treated God's people. Are we, as a citizen of this country, responsible for how our leaders treat the nation of Israel? Should we stand up against anything that is contrary to good treatment of Israel? If we are silent and we don't speak out and demand that proper treatment be given to Israel, what, as a nation, is God promising to us? You reap what you sow. You do, and the nation will be destroyed or damaged completely or a lot. I found the imagery of the wine press interesting because getting every last drop is what a wine press does. You put grapes and stuff in a wine press, you squeeze her down to the last little drops coming out the spigot at the bottom. That's what a wine press does. Now, why would God choose that phraseology? Because he's going to get every drop of wrath out that he has promised for those who have stood against him. Every drop of wrath squeezed out, full measure, total destruction of the wickedness God Jesus finds when he appears at his second coming. This valley of decision is not speaking of man's decision. Oh, by the way, right now, whether you're online or you're here with us together, do you have time to repent of your sins and accept Christ as Lord and Savior right now? Absolutely. You do. Today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. 
today is the day of salvation when men should cry out to the Lord what's being referred to here in Joel 3 decision time for you is over everything that's being decided in this valley will be God's decision and not man's this passage describes the end of the day of the Lord with its accompanying celestial signs and again to me those celestial sign imagery and pieces that are in this are indicators you can't miss this there's no time in history you can't have somebody tell you oh that happened in AD no no none of this has ever happened which means it has to be a foretelling of what's going to happen revelation at the six? yeah revelation revela six? well it's revelation 18, 18. 19 yeah oh, okay. the moon darkened the stars no longer shine that's a sign right there this has to be the end in this valley God makes all the decisions all the judgments and then this hit me the final judgment in Matthew 25 remember Matthew 24 is the tribulation description chapter if you haven't read or have focused on uh, Matthew 24 and understand that everything in Matthew 24 is a description of what will go on during the tribulation you need to recalibrate your thinking but after that chapter we get to Matthew 25 and what Matthew 25 is describing here is the end obviously if 24 is talking about the tribulation then 25 is what's going to happen after it and this is what Matthew says but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him then he will sit upon his glorious throne can this be any other time other than the end of the tribulation he's not sitting on his throne any other time in history it has to be then all the nations will be gathered in his presence notice the corporateness of that and he will sit separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left by the way sheep are those who he's talking about nations here okay the nations that tried to help Israel during that period of time obviously some of them had to revolt against the Antichrist there are going to be nations groups that did I think about um, when the Jews were persecuted in World War II and like some nations would take them in and hide them and try to take care of them okay it's kind of the same thing here it's it's the Holocaust part two only worse in a lot of ways there are going to be nations that go uh, uh, you know I'm giving lip service to the Antichrist but I'm I'm helping them save them yeah and what's the um, image of Oh, that's Baphomet. Baphomet. Yeah, the goat's head. And that's being that's very prevalent right now. Oh yeah, it is. That's right. But notice the phraseology, and, I, and again, I think most people, when you study this particular scripture, you have the strange concept that this has something to do with the church during the dispensation of grace. How much more clear could it be when it says, "When the Son of Man comes in His glory"? That's at the end. The, what he's being talked about here is the nations at the end of the tribulation. Okay, you have to keep that in mind. Not only that, he sits on his glorious throne. He does. Then the king will say to those on his right, those are the good guys who tried to help the people of Israel, Come, you are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you invited me into your home do you connect the dots are you seeing what I'm telling you here this is really really important many people will not teach you this properly because they're not getting the time frame reference correct those are the fruits of the spirit yeah uh, true but notice I was hungry who would be hungry during the tribulation as he's talking about Lots of people. the Jews people my people were hungry and you fed them I was thirsty and you gave me a drink I was a stranger and you invited me into your home I was naked and you gave me clothing I was sick and you cared for me I was in prison and you visited me this is the tribulation this is the end of it this is the Jewish people's persecution people trying to help them by the way I'm not don't get me wrong is scripture multifaceted absolutely is this talking about us and how we treat people and our brothers and sisters on the earth today absolutely those are all good things and that's 
I, I, part of the intent of this scripture was to get you to see that. But the time stamp here in 25 is talking about how people, nation groups on the earth treated the people of Israel during this horrible tribulation period. You fed me, you took care of me, you clothed me, you helped me out, okay? You got to keep that reference in mind here. Then these righteous ones will say, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison or visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did this to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters. Jesus is talking about the Jewish people, his brothers and sisters. You're doing it for me. Now, again, we are part of the family of God right now. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, absolutely. And as we take care of each other, visit each other in prison, feed each other, clothe each other, help in those kinds of events, are we doing this thing? Yes, we are. But pointedly, what 25 is talking about is the end of the tribulation since he is judging the nations in the valley of decision. Are you with me? How many of you ever looked at it that way before or seen that snapshot? Probably not many because you've been taught in a different flavor. And again, I'm not trying to dissuade you in that flavor because that's all true and that's all good. But notice the beginning of this, when the Son of Man comes in his glory. It is a pointed time stamp there. And they will go away, this is verse 46, I jumped on down, you can see up above, uh, to eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Who are these? Who are the ones that will go into eternal punishment? The unbelievers. These are the goats. These are the goats. The goat nations. Who are those that are going to come into eternal life? The sheep nations. The ones that treated Israel properly and tried to help them when they were in this... That there is, that's right. Goat nation, boy. <laughs> Denny, do you think perhaps since that was talking about when Jesus comes right. in his full glory, he's yep. going to come back with his bride. He is. Would he have referred to the church as brothers and sisters if we were his bride? In, that, about, in that particular... In that for reference. Now, maybe in the when he was here the first time, he may have. Sure. We changed definition... When we come back with him, we do. We are his. We, we are, are the bride. bride. We are the bride. I don't know that he would refer to his bride as. We're not. Or yeah. Sisters. How would you refer to your bride as but a brother or sister? He would the Jewish. People. Sure. Great point and observation because I think most people skip by that and they don't see that piece. And I think that's a very interesting concept that we are not referred to as his brothers and sisters. That's, people that are going to help them are probably believers. They are believers. They, they yeah. That's right. During the tribulation, they will be believers, obviously, or you wouldn't be helped. And he's judging the people that are left on earth. Yeah, that's right. A new day is coming. Let's finish this up, and we're going to be done, believe it or not. If somebody would read 17 through 21, or I will if you want me to. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy. Never again will foreigners invade her. In that day, the mountains will drip new wine and the hills will flow with milk. All of the ravines in Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of Acacias. But Egypt will be desolate, Edom a desert waste, because of violence done to the people of Judah. In those days, they shed innocent blood. Judah will be inhabited forever and Jerusalem through all generations. Their blood guilt, which I have not pardoned, I will pardon. The Lord dwells in Zion. That's it. Amen and amen. A new day is coming. A new day is coming. We see it coming, actually. Final thoughts here before we wrap up today. Um, when the Jews left Egypt on their journey to the promised land, it was described as a land of flowing with milk and honey, wasn't it? He told them, hey, you follow me, you tell, do what I ask you to, I'm going to take you to a place, you're going to love it. It's going to be great. Here at the end of the tribulation, that blessing of God upon the land will be restored, but even greater. 
when God comes back and sets up this kingdom on the earth for a thousand years, the reclamation of the earth will begin. It will be as Eden in the sense of how foliage and animals and the beauty of all that there is will be reestablished on the earth. The blessing upon the land will be restored. In the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ, the earth is redeemed. And I use that word specifically because most of the time you use the word redeemed, it's like me. Yeah, I'm redeeming me. It's about saving me. But God's going to not only save you, he's going to save the earth. He's going to redeem or transform or restore, redeem the earth. Transforming it back into the place it was intended to live in since the beginning. Don't you long for that day? I don't know about you, but I'm ready for the day of restoration and, re and redeeming. Not our home. This is not our home. Great and amazing things are still to come for all of us who have placed our faith in Christ's finished work on the cross. Amen. I has not seen nor ear heard that which I have prepared for you. Boy, is that a blessing? You think about the trials and that we go through now and the pains and the aches and the struggles and the loss of loved ones and all the stuff that we go through. And the... That'll be no more. No more. No Matter of fact... That's the next thing I wrote when I was doing my notes. Difficulties and the weariness of this present age won't even come to your mind in that day. You won't be, I remember. No, you won't. You won't care. It will be so blissful and wonderful. You'll go, man, this is just like it should be and always should have been. Is this nice or what? Maranatha. Maranatha. The conditions on the earth now bear witness to the fact that we are very close to the events that are looked at in the book of Joel. There are many who will telling you, ah, 50 years, ah, maybe 100 years. Christ will come back, you know, maybe a century or so. It, you're, you're not awake. You're not seeing what's going on. You, you're not connecting the dots. It's here. It's now. The time is... I see a bunch of ostriches with their heads stuck in the sand. <laughs> That's the truth. Well, we, we can't wait another 50, 100 years. We, we will man on Mars in a hundred years. Oh, we will. And therefore, the Bible will become obsolete. Yeah, it would. Technology it, is going to surpass yep. what the scripture says. Yep. Because, I mean, you've got, you got Elon Musk right now figuring out how to colonize Mars. Yep. And the technology is exponentially increasing. It's Daily. Not, yes. Daily, not just monthly or yearly. I just can't see that it's feasible Unless something happens that resets the world, like some catastrophic event, yeah, like Yellowstone blowing up and the whole world going, and then setting us back to the 1800s, yeah, there's no way we can go on. No. We are the yeah. Fig tree generation, fig tree generation. Yeah, we're we're in that pocket, and time is running out. But the night of darkness for those who rejected Christ. That has to come first, and that's the tragedy of it. And I think the message that if I'm doing anything by what we do here together than trying to teach you lovely people a little something out of the Bible, it's those of you who are watching online to understand that there's a night of darkness coming. And if you've not accepted Christ, you're going to go through the night of darkness. You don't want to go through it. You don't have to go through it. Final thoughts here. Praise God there's a new day coming. Amen and amen to that, right? The Messiah is about to return to reclaim what is rightfully his. Why is it his? Because he paid for it by his own blood. I had something I was crossed my mind. I was going to put this in the notes earlier. You guys remember, and I think you'll never take communion again the same way. When you take the body and the blood, okay, the body is the symbol of his sacrifice on the cross and the blood of what he shed. But there's a deeper meaning to the blood part when you go through communion. In a Judean wedding, two parties come together and agree that, yes, my son and your daughter are going to be married. They meet in the city square. The bridegroom has a cup of wine. The bride-to-be comes out from amongst her family walks toward the bridegroom and the bridegroom offers the cup of wine. The bride has a choice. When you drink the wine, 
you confirm the marriage covenant. If the bride refused the wine, the marriage is on. What happens is the bridegroom is then handed a pitcher of wine. The groom then pours wine into a ceremonial cup that will be offered to his desired bride-to-be. And it was called the cup of joy, with both hands reverently and respectfully and fearfully, he would pass it to his bride. When the groom presents the cup, she now has the choice to, uh, as to whether or not she will accept or reject this proposal for marriage. The moment the cup is handed to the bride, she's given all power to stop the wedding by pushing the cup back and rejecting the bridegroom. Contrary to all other wedding customs in the Middle East, the bride in the Galilean wedding possessed the final authority. She alone had the power to accept or reject the offer from the groom. The betrothal could not be completed without her willing acceptance to drink from the cup of wine. But on this day, during this betrothal, the bride accepts. The groom will then also take and drink from the cup, solidifying the new covenant. But then he says something truly profound. And then the bridegroom says publicly so everyone can hear, you are now consecrated to me by the laws of Moses, and I will not drink of this cup again until I drink it anew with you in my father's house. Every time you drink the communion cup, you confirm your marriage agreement with the Son. Different meaning to you when you take communion now. It's not only a remembrance of what he did on the cross, it is a remembrance of the covenant that you have purposely, individually taken upon yourself as you drink the wine Yes, I am the bride of Christ. Yes, I am acknowledging that covenant. So, now that we know this, what should we be doing? Well, the first thing I think most of us would be doing is watch and pray. Are we aware that the time is short? We're watching. Are we praying that we're found worthy doing His will and in His way when He comes? I hope you are, because that's what I'm praying. Here's another thing we should be doing. Look up for your redemption draws nigh. By the way, that's, that's the good news. When you've been redeemed, that's what you're looking for. I know Christ is coming. I know he's coming for his bride. I'm his bride. I'm coming. He's coming for me. I'm looking up. By the way, this way, looking down, is looking at the earth. Okay, you with me? Looking up is looking to your home, heaven right if you're focused on the earth you're not looking up if you're focused on where you're going your head's lifted up right and we have a, a reason to be uh, uh, joyful for each I, day that's coming because yeah. it could happen look up day. your redemption draws nigh look up um, I think it was was it Mark Twain who said this you're so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good by the way, he had it absolutely false. That's absolutely the wrong way to say that. It's only when you're heavenly minded that you're of any earthly good. When you know where you're going, you can help folks get there. When you don't know where you're going, you never help yourself or others either. Or you only help yourself. Yeah. So 
what should we be doing about our father's business bringing the lost sheep into the sheepfold hopefully by doing what we're doing here today we brought some in encourage one another with these words it's almost over almost over it's almost over the rapture is at hand and we are not appointed to the wrath of God amen, amen. <laughs> encourage one another with these words and again I say Maranatha Maranatha we do the Holy Spirit living within us and guiding us absolutely okay any thoughts anything yes dear oh no kidding and the time is near everybody has to be brought in that's right get them in the boat yeah oblivious believing and not seeing and, and it's a, a should be a burden I think to every believer that we don't want those people oh no and it's becoming harder and harder to talk to somebody about Jesus because they scoff mm -hmm. which this yeah of course yeah. the Bible says that's what it's going to be like in the end time but Satan's putting that wall up slowly yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but thank God that he's blessed us with his insight and the ability to see what's coming anyway uh, let's go to the Lord and pray. Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you for these blessed people that have come by way of video or by way of just being in the home with us together. We are so grateful for them. So, so honored that you guys have spent time with us looking into God's word. Help this message go forth and touch lives and bring people into the kingdom because we know the time is short and we want as many people together in that joyous time when we hear the words, come up hither at the rapture of the church. Help us, Father, to do your will and in your way. And all God's people said. Amen. Amen.